Hello and welcome to Music Works. Today we are delighted to welcome tenor and opera singer Patricia Yates, who is a trans woman. There is so much in this episode that is essential listening. We'll be talking about the physical effects of transitioning on the voice, the problems of defining the voice by gender, about inclusivity, and how the classical music world, and especially opera, needs to change and be more open to gender diversity. As Patricia writes in a recent article for the Musicians' Union blog celebrating International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia, as a young transgender opera singer at the start of her career, I want to wear my transness on my sleeve and claim it as a key part of my artistic identity. She goes on to say, I write this piece not based on the assumption that any individual or organisation deliberately excludes trans folks, but with a view to addressing a blind spot and how to approach it. In the spirit of which, we'll now go to the Music Works podcast where Patricia Yates is waiting to share her thoughts and experiences as a classically trained tenor who is also trans. But first, here's a message from Allianz. Music Works is generously supported by Allianz Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer with cover for all types of instruments and musical equipment, protecting you against accidental damage, loss, theft and more. Allianz offer a team of music experts who understand musicians' needs and lifestyles, especially helpful during the strange times we're in. You can get cover for all types of instruments and musical equipment with protection against accidental damage, loss, theft and more. Also, unlike home insurance, there's no access to pay on instrument or accessory claims. At the moment, Allianz have a special online offer with two months free cover, not only that, every Allianz Music policy now includes free legal assistance and support, so you can protect yourself both as a musician and in your personal life. Find out more at alliancemusic.co.uk. Allianz, serving the music community since 1960, proud insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Hello Patricia, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me, it's great to be here. Welcome. So today we have Patricia Yates, tenor, and Patricia, you're just about to finish your undergraduate music degree at the University of Leeds, is that right? Yeah, just next week. Congratulations and thank you so much for coming on the podcast at this busy time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's my pleasure. This is the, I, remember, I used to work for a university, so I remember only too well what it's like at this time of year for students. Yeah. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, we've come here to talk about trans people in the world of opera and trans and non-binary um, inclusion in the world of opera. And I think we're going to have a lot to talk about today. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So where shall we start? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big subject. I mean, I think there are there are lots of factions that we can go into. Um, the like the main thing that I am focused on is it's my metier, as it were, is trans performers um, in opera and our ability to slot in and and be authentically ourselves uh, in in opera productions and in uh, the characters that we play. Absolutely, and as we've just discussed in our sort of pre pre episode conversation um we there are so many different ways in which um this can be better um mm -hmm. and this can be dealt with really well so what I would, there's the way language is used there's the there's inclusive thinking in um in approaches to casting and mm -hmm. and to thinking about um opera in general i wonder maybe we should start with language because i feel like that is a really useful um way of it, way of explaining some of um, yeah. some of the things that a good way of opening yeah. opening up exactly. the, the subject um the main thing the main thing for me is um the way that we think about uh singers voices and singers identities and how those two things intersect because for me as a trans singer um i've grown up my entire life singing in the boys section of the choirs and singing uh singing male roles uh and having a male voice um, and you see it in like, you know, all the, the big male voice choirs of the world. It's kind of 
it's kind of forced onto us to believe that low voice equals male uh, and it's just factually incorrect first of all and secondly is 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 harmful to a lot of identities of trans people and non-binary people when when we don't fit into that box and it's the same the other way around of course my own experiences of course just just being categorized as a male voice when really i think the binary that that is present currently should be switched to something that's far more scientific based and is just lower upper so we talk about lower voices and upper voices rather than male and female voices or men's voices and women's voices because it's far more inclusive and it's just so clear like in any musical discourse that you're going about um you and you need to to separate those two things like if you have a lower voice chorus or, a, or an upper voice chorus or whatever you can use those those words and it's still as clear what the director and the con or conductor means when when they're addressing a cast for example absolutely and we do of course have lower voice you know women to use the old language and higher voice men and boys in particular obviously church mm -hmm. choir traditions and so on you it's always um talked about in that kind of treble um alto tenor bass kind of um yeah totally scenario, isn't it so it's, it's interesting i think how i feel like the potential exists already for opera and um singing to be incredibly inclusive and and um to lose all of this gender gendered language because um we have tons of examples already of where the high voice equals women and the low voice equals men scenario doesn't work in what happens mm -hmm. already don't we precisely with things like trouser rolls when when a mezzo soprano um a cis woman is playing um, a, a male character on stage uh, in a lot of Mozart operas and a lot of Handel operas and you know a lot of early music where these roles might have otherwise been played by castrati um, that 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 language is already you know incorrect if we're going to talk about the characters uh, and um, then then you have trans singers who might also want to play these roles there's a trans singer in Norway for example called Adrian Angelico and he uh, is a trans man uh, and hasn't altered his voice or anything with testosterone treatments or anything like that. He prefers to keep his voice uh, as it sort of naturally was by birth um, because he's already had a very successful career as a mezzo-soprano. Uh, and now he specialises in, tr in trouser roles, um, which is which is wonderful. I think that's such an, a cool specialism to have. Yeah, it's very personal, isn't it? It's like, this is my precise, you know, my precise specialism that's brilliant that's his slot in the opera yeah. world and that and that that's great and i think there is just so much more scope for that to happen across the board yeah absolutely absolutely um I've, so i've just read your article that you've written for the musicians union um called normalizing trans bodies in opera really mm. fantastic article and congratulations and um anyone who is interested in reading about this um the, there's a lot of really good information there we're just putting the link on the screen and we'll put Thank it in you. the show notes as well um and you mention in that that there are differences in the way um the pro the process of transitioning treats male and female voices because of the hormones used and i didn't know that so could you explain that please sure um so for um for AFAB trans people, that's assigned female at birth trans people um, who are often trans masculine or trans men, um, to medically transition, uh, one of the main things that people first do is um, go on to hormone replacement therapy, and this is for, for this is for trans for trans feminine people as well. Um, but in trans masculine people, the hormone therapy is to take testosterone and like in um, a boy's natural puberty, the voice lowers, the voice drops and uh, that change is actually irreversible. And so for um, AMAB trans people, that's like myself assigned male at birth. Um, if we have already gone through puberty, our voice, that, that change is still irreversible. So the testosterone that has already caused those changes at puberty, um, like the first puberty, as I like to call it, is are, are irreversible and so when we take um, hormone, hormone replacement therapy with estrogen and testosterone blockers and anti-androgens and those sorts of things um, the voice doesn't raise for trans women the voice doesn't get higher um, we remain at our, at our voice and we can do other things to, to change that 
I know, for example, um, a trans singer in, based in California called Brianna Sinclair, and she um, has sort of retrained her voice as a countertenor, and she now sings mezzo-soprano rep, so, even soprano rep, like she's she's been singing um, Delilah. Delilah, oh, love. Yeah, in fact, singing Delilah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and it, it suits her voice so well, and, you know, that shows what you can do through, through training, and she felt that that was more authentic to her. Mm. Um, and then some of us prefer to stay in our own voices, like myself. I'm, I'm, I'm happy being a tenor and I love my voice as it is. And I think I've trained my voice to be where it is. And I'm, I, I think I'm talented and would, would hate to sort of come away from what I've known and loved and, and what people have told me that I'm, I can have a career in. But I, I do think there needs to be some uh, accommodations made so that I can exist happily in the opera world without being forced into some of these boxes which I have been forced into all my life that make me feel really uh, rejected from from spaces. So you need the space to be um, a, a tenor who is a woman? Is that the right well, terminology? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whereas um, <laughs> Whereas, you know, the, the mezzo that you mentioned from Norway um, didn't want to change his voice because, uh, you know, and he wanted to occupy that space. And we, we need to create a world in which um, those things are, people are not naturally excluded by the language we're using and, and people are, are yeah. ac actively included, in fact, by, by um, changes we make, primarily, I guess, to language and also some, some perceptions to do with casting and so on. Would, would you agree? Yes, I mean, there there are a lot of traditionalists still in opera, um, and that doesn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily translate to um, to every opera company in the world, uh, but it does to a lot. I think I think, yeah. and there whether whether conscious or not, bias is real, uh, and bias exists, and. You know, let's call it unconscious bias because we like to believe the best in people. That unconscious bias is very present, and if you read, you know, if you read the works of people like Jane Elliott, who've who've talked about it on race, or Judith Butler, who talks about it on gender, you will see that that they explain it in a very real way that you understand, and you just completely reassess yourself, like you reassess the way that you view the world, and you have to, you have to be really self-critical in order to. Uh, in order to approach that unconscious bias that may or may not exist and probably does. So it's, it's, you're a victim of this too. If, you know, if you are perpetrating unconscious bias, you are also a victim of it because, because you've been indoctrinated by the way that society has, has progressed and the way that society has kind of built up these ideas around surrounding race and surrounding gender. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's worth saying that we all have unconscious bias. It's just, it's completely unavoidable. I can't possibly imagine how you could not have some kind of unconscious bias somewhere. It's all about awareness, I think. Yeah. Willingness to learn and change. Um, and I don't mean willingness to learn in the case of kind of constantly asking questions of people who know and then going, oh, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, For sure. we, as you said, you have to be self, you have to be self critical, you have to be willing to, um, to know that things that you thought or things that you said, or things that you believed before are, are not helpful to people are, and, are, yeah. um, and exclude people and to be willing to change that. And I, I do, I have to say, it's very, it's a topic that comes up a lot on this podcast. It's something that comes up a lot in, in all of our lives at the moment. And I'm, I'm literally, I'm just so happy that that's true, um, that there are so many people that are looking at things like this and, and that there seems to be, I hope, um, a big movement across everything that excludes people. So there has been yes. in the past lots and lots of movements, obviously originally it was, it was, it was women way back in, you know, with suffragettes and so on. And then mm -hmm. there's been a lot to do with race and a lot to do with um, gay people and, um, you know, like the... Um, um, the drag queen movement in um, in the eighties and and that kind of yeah. thing to and um, you know it just goes on and on but now it feels like it's not necessarily pinpointed on specific things but it's actually just everyone's thinking about everything um, I hope anyway and I'm sure that there are things yes. that aren't but um, but it seems to me that um, so the reason we're actually having this conversation is because we we were talking at a 
um, a conversation about safeguarding in the industry, in the music industry, mm. a while ago. Um, and you made the point that it's almost impossible to safeguard trans people in the industry because they're not really because being we're not in. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that really, you know, is, you know, we're so far behind with this within the music industry. So I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, we're having this conversation. Opening doors. <laughs> yes, exactly. So tell me, let's come back to language. So tell me, give me some examples of, um, of where language can be altered for the better, maybe in, in application forms or in rehearsals or in different settings because obviously it's, it's hard with this with being a freelancer because you have to go into different settings all the time you can't just yeah. change one thing and then it's like right <laughs> you know my organization now understands <laughs> <laughs> well yeah exactly as a freelancer yeah. we're going between lots of different companies lots of different organizations choirs opera companies or you know everything and we're meeting so many different people who are in charge of those um setting in in those spaces uh and currently I'm, I'm always entering those spaces as a bit of an outlier. Um, so whenever I'm in an ensemble, for example, um, I'm being categorized automatically as a result of um, antiquated ideas about gender, uh, as, as a part of the men's choir or as part of the, the group of voices that we call male voices. Um, and it would, be far, it would be far more helpful and far more inclusive for, for me to enter those spaces if we could shift towards a different a different binary talking about the upper lo upper voices and lower voices rather than the female voices and the male voices um and as it is presently i i have to go to every every conductor that i that i work with and say to them hey um i know that you might have a certain ways of working i know that you might have language that's ingrained um but while i'm in this space I, and and preferably beyond, um, could you use the language that, that includes me and that um, is appropriate to me? Uh, and everybody is always so so willing to oblige, like more than willing to oblige, and they go, oh my gosh, I'd never thought about that before. And this is the thing, it's never, in, in my experience, it's so it's so rarely a malicious thing. Nobody is nobody is excluding trans people maliciously or 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 you know or thinking that trans people don't exist in the opera industry, they just haven't made those connections. That connection that the language that it that is used doesn't always apply, uh, and there is a far more succinct and far more direct way of of addressing things sometimes. Um, that also includes trans folks and non-binary folks. So, mm, absolutely, you hear it everywhere, don't you? I used to do an aquafit class, and there was there was one cis man in this in this aquafit class and the rest of us were all women um because that was the nature of you know mm -hmm. the exercise <laughs> he was doing quite yeah. a female thing and um and he was really annoyed because the because the leader of the class kept going okay ladies this that and the other <laughs> and you know he was getting really i could hear him grumbling and i was going well you know that it's just you know how the tables have turned <laughs> i know i know and I felt, I, you know, I just, you don't like to see it happening to anybody, do you? But it is just so ingrained. And I'm guessing if you teach these I kind of classes, it's, you know. It's easy okay. to laugh when the shoe is on the other foot, isn't it? Yes, it is. It um, is. And, 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 you know, I, I, should, I shouldn't laugh really, but, but at the same time, um, a lot of cis people haven't had to fight, fight so hard to express their identity openly to the world. Um, and so, it, you know, there is a, there is a difference there. There is, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm making an assumption there that this man does not have, a, um, you know, a, a history of having to behave like that for some reason or another. Maybe he did. But um, yeah, it certainly didn't feel like, I mean, it was, it didn't feel, it felt like a grumble, not a, you know, sure. a, not a serious matter in that case. But yeah, no, I completely agree. And um, the, the way we experience this is different for everyone, I think. Yeah. And um, it does point out actually that, that, you know, a lot of people who are trans exclusive exclusory by by principle if we went around calling misgendering them for an entire year i don't think they'd like it very much either you know mm. it's sort of yeah absolutely Is that people I, i've in my experience of talking to people about um inclusivity issues across um race gender and so on is it is all i've hardly ever met anyone who wouldn't see it if it was happening to them it's this yeah. sort of um you know the privilege of not having had to go through it 
yourself that causes it and I think recognizing that again for, I mean obviously for me as a um as a, a, a white straight woman I'm largely very privileged in in a lot of um ways and apart from um gender stuff sometimes um I haven't had a vast amount of experience in all this so for me to I'm get sure. to deal with um the guilt that I felt when I realized the things that I'd been doing to um to be less inclusive in the past um was to you know was essentially to recognize how privileged I was and to say that yeah. you know, I'm, I'm gonna not you know make these assumptions anymore it's a shame that that manifests itself in guilt but I I, I understand that because because I've done, I've I've had the same the same things happen to me like literally I'm sure I've probably said some incredibly transphobic things in the past when I was just completely uneducated and and had no idea like about about the way that gender works in our society um it's it, it's it's a symptom of of the world we live in yeah I think so I had this conversation with someone the other day I'm of the generation and I I actually kind of don't want to say this but I'm going to say it anyway I'm of the generation when I was a teenager and in my early 20s um like gay was a, a thing that you said like to be like oh, that's so gay meaning that's so bad or something like that and it was never I would never have considered myself homophobic I know, I know everyone was just like, oh, loads of gay people <laughs> you know so on and so forth and I just it was just what people said and that's been true throughout history, you know, the way, um, you know, people of like my grandparents' generation used like the N word to describe black people. And, yeah. you know, um, this has always been the case that there's been highly um, offensive language that's been normal. And I think that the difference really is um, knowing that that was not OK and not doing yeah. it anymore and not just saying, oh, well, I'm of that generation, so I'm just going to keep doing it. Um, because I, you know that is hopefully where we're at now is that people are uh, are hearing these things and, and changing that behaviour. I think I th I think it is. I, I'm I'm currently very optimistic, you know, <laughs> ab about about the future and where it's going. And I think I think unfortunately, especially in the UK, there are there are a, there's a vocal a very vocal minority who are um, trans exclusory and. You know they're shouting very very loudly but mm. but we're existing and we're we're persisting so and is that um what is the re relation of, of that to um to the opera and music world specifically is that something you come across in music circles in particular um i ha i haven't i haven't come across anybody who was um in the music profession who was actively exclusory of me or actively discriminating against me fortunately um i've heard a couple of stories of people who have uh but i think it's i think it's a minority even more of a minority in in music and artistic circles just because in general artistic people are tend to be slightly more free and open-minded because because of the nature of our work um and this is the other thing that i don't understand is that like given that we're that given that we are free free-spirited a lot of the time we're quite often quite liberal in the arts um and we are incredibly open-minded why are there still these walls that we've built up surrounding surrounding gender in opera and i think i think ultimately it comes to, it comes down to um to history and clinging on to tradition because that's essentially what we do where every time that we create an operatic production um you know every major opera house has 90 percent of its program that is all pre 21st century at least um and yeah. most often it's all from the 19th 18th 17th centuries it is a, an art form that is particularly bound in the repetition of historical work, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and clinging to those know, traditions. And the, obviously these historical works, they don't include anyone who dresses differently from the gender that they that their voice indicates they occupy. Or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no examples of that that happen in opera anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> this seems so funny to me that in a in a tradition where um uh you know the the swapping of gender roles seems to uh with voice type seems to be quite prevalent especially in yeah. earlier opera that yet it's so difficult to to um 
modernize that, I suppose, in terms of, yeah. um, uh, you know, trans inclusive casting. Is that, yeah. is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just struck, it's just struck me how inherently queer opera is, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and if we're not, you know, queerifying these spaces today, if we're not queerifying these productions and these um, these pieces of music today, what you know, where where are we going? I think there's a, there's a definitely an argument for um, for opera to to look to the future and to keep developing and adapting and to keep it alive so that it doesn't just stagnate because I, th I think traditionalism and and these sort of antiquated um, themes that are upheld in a lot of traditional opera you know they need to they need to die as they're dying in society mm. and and be reimagined somehow in in modern in modern opera productions of them so you know for example the incredibly racist slave-like characters that are in a lot of mozart's operas uh they just need to they just need to go because because we're you know you can pay homage to them and you can say oh we're we're honoring uh we're honoring something and, and drawing attention to it because it was because it was incredibly racist at the time and we want to um we want to say 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 no to that you, you can say that you're doing that and you know in, in a lot of cases it's done well I'd say but but why not instead cast an incredibly diverse cast for the rest of the opera and and have and not have these characters as slaves mm. at all I, yeah exactly I mean I think the um to give so much airtime to the um bias of the past is just you know, in in the in the interests of history, I mean, it's everywhere, isn't it? It's in the statues. It's in it's in the way history is taught in schools. It's it, yeah. it's in it's in literally everything. It doesn't need any more airtime. <laughs> it has that. Yeah. <laughs> People absolutely, aren't going to forget. Agreed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I agree completely. Um, and also, I mean, I just I don't know about you. As as things have changed, just over the last couple of years, and um, things to do with language and gender have have become a lot more. Um, well understood and Black Lives Matter has, has, Black Lives Matters has happened. I found that I actually can't watch certain things anymore. Like my husband and I sat down to watch a film from I guess maybe the mid nineties the other day and it was a film that we both enjoyed a few years ago. It was like sort of funny, silly, all the characters mm -hmm. are like men doing actiony stuff and the women female characters are rubbish and uh, I can't remember what it was called. We just sat down to watch it and I was and like, I kind of thought, okay, this is going to be a bit passe, but there's going to be some good jokes in it and that's fine. And I just couldn't watch it and he couldn't either. Yeah. We turned it off after 10 minutes. I was like, it's just not, it's not relevant anymore. The, the humour does not balance out what it's depicting as a whole. I'm too kind of angry with the way society is and like, I need I to see things that are, that resonate with me more and now Today, I've started when, yeah, yeah when I go through Netflix I'm looking at stuff and I'm going yeah 2011 hmm, maybe not 2019 okay I'll give that a go <laughs> it's just like... I think it's it's so true and I, yeah. I, I found myself re-watching Friends recently and the amount of like homophobic and transphobic rhetoric in that is just overwhelming it's like I can't I can't I can't play with that anymore I don't want to have anything to do with it like cut it out just cut it out and yeah it, and, it spoils and everything else it does you can't yeah i agree i think it it just means you can't enjoy it anymore and i feel the same that's that's what um when you said about just cutting things out in opera i mean i just think we forgive opera so much because it is so it is this kind of it, it's potentially difficult to cut bits out of it although people do it all the time because it's like music and words together and so on and mm. so forth but really mm. we're quite creative as creatives so we can, we can find ways to um uh either listen to different things or to listen to the same things in different ways in different ways, in different ways. Um, what you just said was really interesting to me about about we're really creative people we have so many creative contacts can you not find a way yeah just really try harder like yeah. I, <laughs> We I can do I, anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I've thought this so often about um, about the potentiality for voice swapping roles. Um, 
I would love to 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 be walking into a world in my career uh, where I where I'm able to sing roles that were written for women um, that traditionally have been soprano roles, and I don't think we're that far off getting there necessarily. Last year, um, Stephanie Blythe was cast as Gianni Schicchi in uh, the Puccini opera. And now she's not trans, but she was going to play the role in drag. And I think that's epic, firstly, um, and she's epic. And and secondly, <laughs> that, is opening, that is opening doors for the potentiality of it happening for, for trans people as well, for trans singers. I think we are on our way to getting there. Um, and for having for having that place in opera that we can feel totally comfortable to play these characters. Absolutely, I, and I remember even just when I was at uni about maybe uh, oh it's probably long ago now. I'd like to remember what maybe ten years ago and uh, having this mm -hmm. massive discussion about whether it was okay for women to sing Winterizer. You know, it's like, it's just, <laughs> yeah. there's not even a role there. It's just poetry that refers to being in love with a woman. You know, it's just like, so, and obviously it was written for, for a baritone, but you know, really. And then, you know, the whole thing being, oh, well, Janet Baker did it. So therefore, you know, she's kind of, but she could only do it because she's so epic. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, it's just so. Well, um, we don't, we don't make rules for one person and not for the other, do we now? Well, exactly, exactly. There you go. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it would be great to see that. And so I've, we haven't talked um, as much as I thought we were going to about um, the thing that you have touched on a bit about the, the association that we have with voices and gender mm -hmm. and, and particularly yes. in the context of casting and roles. Um, let's talk about that because there's a lot in that as well in, in the way that we, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. the way that we think about roles and um, characters and the way that that seems to be associated in opera with voices and with a lot of characteristics of the actors and singers themselves. Okay, we could start at casting maybe, mm -hmm. um, because that's often where this process does start. Um, so a lot of a lot of places are opening up to the idea of, of like having blind casting now, for example, mm -hmm. um, which I think could be quite a healthy thing. Um, for the prospects of having more gender diverse performers in in the opera world and it's definitely going to be a, a healthy thing for having more racially diverse ethnically diverse people in uh, in roles in operas as well um and at least getting the opportunities to you know get to that second round of auditions where they actually meet you face to face for example uh and then again there's there's the issue of language again so I can I can already just picture myself walking into a blind audition and sort of standing behind the screen with the with the the panel on the other side of the screen and them saying um okay so um this tenor th this is a, a, a tenor who's auditioning for the role of blah 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 he's going to sing and me just being <laughs> uh, yeah and me just cringing so hard so you know I think something has to ha happen there as well and th this is something that I that I push for kind of in my daily life as well, not not necessarily relating to um, opera or, or music in any way, but using language such as they, them to describe people whose gender you are unaware of um, mm -hmm. or, or isn't clear in any way, or actually for any stranger that you meet on the street, no matter how they present. Because mm -hmm. those, that idea that, um, that appearance governs what gender you are is, totally outdated for cis people and trans people and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be um subscribing to that view anymore any of us mm. uh so the use of, of things like they then pro pronouns to to discuss people in like a blind audition setting for example i think would be really healthy for everyone involved mm. um moving moving forwards you know um well, the, the adjustments you're talking about are so small aren't they literally like, because we do it we do it anyway like it's just the visual link that yeah. that turns that off in our brain somehow because we do it oh some you, you know you're sat at a cafe oh someone's left their keys uh i'll i'll hand it into the the kiosk and hope hope they come to collect them you know yeah well we, we don't we do know it every who's left day. the keys yeah exactly and when you think about what the changes are that you know that we want people to make you know, it really is just 
a tiny change for an enormous impact. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And it doesn't affect it doesn't affect cis people in any way. It doesn't negatively affect cis well, people. Well, we, by... we wouldn't even notice. Like, I mean, we would yeah. because we're, but you know, like, it would, yeah, absolutely. If I walked into an audition and someone said, you know, they're going to sing, I would just never, it wouldn't even question connect. it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so what 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 would be sort of next in this in this idea of this like process. yeah let's, so let's go through the process <laughs> let's fix the whole thing <laughs> but we've missed the stage already because we haven't covered the application to be auditioned <laughs> of course of course forgetting about that god must yeah. have cast it from my mind <laughs> yeah well indeed Barrier number one, you might say, although probably yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I find uh, in a lot of application forms that I come into contact with, whether it's for like um, applying for a competition or applying for um, a, a grant or some sort of funding or or applying for a young artist program or or anything, auditioning for anything, um, you often have to tick this box that says male or female. Um, and for me, even for me, when I when I um, am a, am a woman and uh, identify as female, it's not so straightforward because I know in the back of my mind when there's this binary option to choose from that this organisation that I'm about to um, make contact with is asking me, uh, are you a lower voice or an upper voice? But they're asking me in a way that that means I have to misgender myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's not even talking about the fact that it completely erases um, non -bin every non-binary gender identity uh, and just throws that out the window. Mm. You know, if you want to know what somebody's voice type is because you want to see how suitable they are for a, a, a job, have the selection of voice types down the side of the page instead. <laughs> yeah. It's really simple. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's it's so and also I, when you see something like that are you also internally going well this doesn't feel like an organization that's a good fit for me anyway absolutely it immediately flicks this switch in your head that goes i'm not welcome here mm. and it's again it's this case of whether it's conscious bias or not it is something that has a direct effect on the people that are applying for you and you've got to think you know You've got you've got to think well what's in place here that might that might mean that there's a the slightly lower influx of gender diverse performers or racially diverse performers uh and um you were mentioning to me to me before a lot of people are still in this mindset of well you know if they're actually good enough they'll get the job yeah. and you've got to think of these hurdles that people face before they even get there like is there anything is there anything that you can think of before the actual singing process begins that might have turned people away um through some some messaging that it's sending again whether conscious or not yeah absolutely um for everybody who manages to circumnavigate the limiting boxes on the form how many people have just gone oh, i'm just not going to apply for this yeah yeah absolutely. I, and honestly it's happened to me recently I have, I have, I have looked at a, looked at a form and gone, and just sighed and cl and clicked the cross on the on my computer because because I just part of me just cannot be bothered to go to go through with it. Whereas when I'm when I'm looking for a, a other things, generally like the larger opera companies, for example, I was applying for something recently with the Royal Opera House and their tick box selection it is it's not perfect in my opinion but it's far better they have they have options they have a, a male a female a non-binary and an other box mm. which i think is great at, at the very least everybody should have an other box yeah because you know being othered isn't isn't always the nicest thing but at least you're present at least you're you're being accounted for and being accommodated in some way and you know you can you can self-identify and self-express in those situations where in a in a binary situation where you've got one or the other it's a no it's a no from me yeah. absolutely and with um pronouns as well i mean thinking about the way you know if they're using these 
male female boxers to, to work out voice types as you mentioned having the voice types listed also having a an open text pronouns box i just think it's the most straightforward thing to put on a form and yeah. it just deals with any problems you know if there's somebody sitting scratching their head going i don't know how to deal with the pronouns issue just let people fill it in themselves you know? okay. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah um, yeah and I'm really happy to see that Instagram has just added um, a, a space for pronouns on everybody's profile. So it's being normalised. It's being talked about as like a as just a thing that everybody should do, cis or trans, no matter what. Like these are things, pronouns are things that everybody has. You can't and you know you can't deny that. And just to make just to make it transparent, to make it clear, is so much better for everybody. Yeah, I know. I, I love that. I only recently started using my, my pronouns in this way because I felt like I wasn't quite sure where my place was in doing that, if you see what I mean. And then I was, uh, you know, I did a lot of, I did some thinking about that and, and decided that um, it, we were in a space, I was noticing it more and more. And I felt like mm -hmm. I was in a space where only people who were doing a lot of thinking about it were being very you know having pronouns like we've got on the screen here and yeah. I, I put it on my email signature and in various other places and I was realizing that it was always the people who were doing a lot of thinking about things that were doing that and I was like well that's that's how I know that that's me um, yeah. <laughs> um okay so we have dealt with so we've applied for the job um yeah. <laughs> hurdle overcome <laughs> we've done a blind audition perhaps <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe come. blind maybe yeah. blind maybe with some clues what uh, what else what what happens next um well i suppose i suppose you know getting the job yeah. <laughs> is is the next thing and that's so entirely up to the, the casting the, panel it's the process that the casting panel has to go through to decide um who gets the job and what bias is to do with with voice and gender and look and yes. so on and so forth they might be experiencing i've i've heard of people of trans people trans singers who when they apply for jobs and go go for auditions and are required to bring headshots they bring two headshots with them uh and one is authentic them like out of costume and another is in costume for the for the roles that they're most likely to be playing with with these opera companies and I, in some ways i think that's quite a positive thing because i don't think it's it's wholly positive to to be viewing singers like this as already existing as the character the characters that they're going to be playing because everybody has to put on the wig and the dress and the whatever when they when they go on stage everybody has to vesti la jupa as it as it were um and i think you know you've got to survive at the same time so for for if that works for that for that person and and they're making they're making it work for them by making it easier for a casting panel to view them in in a role in a certain um look then you know good for them they're surviving but i think we should be breaking these things down and just and just viewing the person for their voice i really don't even see why we should necessarily have headshots at all at an audition like surely f for an opera it should be about can the person sing nicely can the person act well in a part can the person move on stage is the person going to be good to work with is the person competent and professional? Uh, tick, yeah, tick, 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 hire them. Yeah, yeah you don't yeah. get any of them from a headshot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yeah, so we're thinking, um, I just, yeah, this thing about casting, I wanna bring up something, I, I don't think I've said, I think we talked about this in the pre-episode um, right. chat rather than in the in this episode. So if I've brought it up in the episode already, apologies for repeating myself. But um, we talked in the safeguarding talk a while ago about how, about um, the differentiation between um, a character and an actor, which feels like it's further on in TV casting, film casting and so on, perhaps, than it is in opera casting. Um, yeah. Would you agree? For, yeah, for sure. I, I think... There are a lot of things to consider there because um, in opera, in, in film and TV, for example, you have 
there's far more of a tradition well not a tradition there's far more of a more of a norm of of um new new things being created with new characters yes. and therefore uh in the context of today trans people in the actual stories that they're creating for, for television and film and so you know there's a lot of conversations about um should cis actors be playing trans characters um that's an entirely different conversation uh, in generally if, if anybody wants to know my personal opinion it's no but um when we think about that in the context of of, of opera um that's kind of not so much the case we have a lot we have basically all cis characters when we're doing anything to do with traditional opera and there are very 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 few trans characters um in in any operas mm. um and there's um there's a there's a thing that that we as, as singers often do when we step into a role and we can we can we can either choose to engage ourself with the character or we can choose to kind of disassociate um and for me uh when i'm singing when i'm stepping in to sing like a male role for example um i'm very often tending towards the the disassociate option because it's easier for me to to act in that role in that way because because i'm disengaging the the feminine side of me i'm disengaging a lot of these tropes <laughs> which one would consider feminine um which i do actually kind of fit into societally uh and instead choosing to engage the acting portion of my brain and and portray that male character who often in these in these productions and these operas uh is masculine which obviously any actor playing a serial killer or a paedophile or... We hope know, they're doing. Of, yeah, indeed. But, you know, it's like the idea that we have to embody the characters that we're playing is just, is just um, you know, wildly disproved um, all over the place, isn't it? And I also just think, I do find it bewildering. I was just thinking about the amount of suspension of disbelief that's required for us to watch any opera at all. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. as an audience, yeah. We literally have to believe that a hat changes someone's entire appearance. And yet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and yet, <laughs> this apparently is too much. Yeah, um, um, yeah, we, it's like we don't, we don't step into step into song every every five minutes in real life yeah. and we don't go around singing so explicitly about our inner our inner feelings every second of every day um as much as we'd like to yeah you know that's not the reality also but, like in, in yeah. earlier opera we don't say everything twice uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. yeah totally yeah just to hammer home the point i mean again maybe we should you know <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's that, yeah. there's that, um, there's that dissonance between, between, yeah, as you say, the suspension of belief to believe that these characters are real, um, and then, and then, you know, one finds it so hard to believe that, um, somebody with a, with a lower voice and, uh, an assigned, someone who's assigned male at birth could be playing a woman, like, mm. like Scandal? I don't know. <laughs> I... <laughs> Uh, so this this year I'm um, I'm preparing for the role of Tamina in Die Zauberflöte, uh, which is really really exciting for me. It's Fabulous. it is for me canonically a trans role, um, mm. and we've created it that way. Um, so she is a, a, a trans princess who is going on this mission to rescue her love from from the from the Temple of Enlightenment, and. And that's so cool. We have, like, that's I feel so like this is something cool. else we, we haven't really talked about, but the, the opportunities that just gender swapping one role can bring about in an opera, like how, how amazing, like we have, we have like five women loving women now in the opera. We have, mm -hmm. um, we have a platonic friendship between a man and a woman, between Tamina and Papageno. We have, um, a woman going to rescue another woman, which re removes the whole damsel in distress idea that's, you know, yes. so common in, in opera. Yeah, indeed. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a that far, is... it's just a different story. It's a different way of telling the story. And, and why would we not want to do that with, with opera? You know, 
not everything's perfect and has to be set in stone with the narratives of a lot of these operas. Well, absolutely, and that's it. And, I, you know, I don't 100% subscribe to the idea that we must, you know, keep rehashing the canon over and over again. But if we really must, we can do it in these incredibly... Um, innovative ways i just love the sound of that as i say i could barely scratch the surface in what that actually means for the relationships in the opera and the and sort yeah. of what the dynamic will be like on stage that's absolutely fabulous um, yeah i was at a rehearsal the other day for it and and we just stopped halfway through and went hang on everyone's gay <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful moment <laughs> that's fabulous oh that's so good now, well, this leads me into, I wanted to, it's been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for, for coming and, and talking to me about this. Um, I've, I've got really a couple of, of questions for you, if that's okay, before we finished. We've talked a bit, yeah. and, you know, I, I keep thinking of other directions I want to take this. I'll try and be brief, but just to say, in terms of things that are quite overarching in the Music Works podcast, one is something that you mentioned, uh, which is that the tradition must develop in order to survive. Um, and I really, really agree with that. I'm just going to read something on my screen right here that you said in your blog post, evolution is essential to the survival of the operatic art form. Could not agree more with that. And we say this a lot on here in terms of uh, talking about new music, in terms of talking about mm -hmm. other kinds of inclusivity as well. So I really just wanted to sort of like <laughs> highlight how utterly I agree with that. Um, so um, the idea that we're all looking for... Um, a specific place to exist within the industry and I think in some ways what you've talked about about um, for instance the singer who um, wanted to specialize in trouser roles and this is like their perfect area I feel mm -hmm. like this is this really should resonate with um, musicians everywhere because people who are going through this kind of journey and having to think in such great detail about their gender or perhaps their their race and and where this puts them within the industry and where they want to be are doing a lot more thinking about this but actually I think that everyone struggles to find their place in the industry especially yeah. the industry you know the industry as we've said that that relies a lot on replaying and re-singing and retelling historic work um you know and the, the question always being do we really need another pianist who specializes in Chopin do we really need this that and the other and people finding where they fit into the modern music industry um and so yeah sorry well i was just going to say i think i think it's important for everybody to find their own artistic identity and that's not always to do with your gender and or, or any or anything like that it is it is something that's that is about as you say finding where you fit in in this sort of very vast world of of opera Absolutely. And so to to come on to that, I wanted to ask um, what your dream role or roles are um, <laughs> that would be your absolute, you know, per perfect opportunity. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I've not thought about it too much because it's like it's like a it's like a forbidden fruit, you know. Um, oh, let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> Like, would you have to make one? Like, does it even exist, you know? Um... Well, I, I, I am always here for singing, for singing new music. And um, something you you'd said just a second ago about, um, about, about having, having more opportunities in, in new music. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna find more diversity naturally in, in, in new music and in music that was composed today because it's because it's present and people are broadcasting their own stuff everywhere. So there's like an abundance of of diversity right like just right within our reach. Um, you know, as we speak we could probably we could probably you know hit with a stone the number of um women composers, you know, uh in in our vicinity. Um so I think I think that's something that I, I, it's a role that maybe hasn't even been created yet, but uh, a role, that, a trans role, for example, a, a trans woman role that's written for, for a tenor, I think would be wonderful for me to, for me to perform. It would be my like perfect role because my transness is a key part of my identity as a singer. And I like to use it in a, in a lot of ways. And I like to use it to think about things differently, to have a unique perspective on roles that were traditionally written for men. Um, and yeah, I think I can bring a lot of 
new things to the table uh, as a woman who's a tenor. And um, I've heard a lot of other people say similar things, you know, it's all about different perspectives and everybody has different perspectives and it's not all about gender. Everybody has different perspectives based on their lived experience. And we can totally just utilize those things in opera. Um, like one of my one of my dream roles, for example, is um, Renuccio in Gianni Schicchi. Um, I would love to be able to sing that role, or Tom Rakewell in Stravinsky's The Rake's Progress. I would love to sing both of those roles, kind of like as a as a young tenor. But but what about making them like Jane Rakewell instead, or or um, I don't know, for want of a better name, Renuccia, like. <laughs> What, yeah. what would that do for the opera, first of all? I think it would open a lot of doors there. But then also, what would it do for me? Like, to even just begin to think about that, it's like, it's almost too much because I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just almost bursting out of my seat thinking about it. It's, it's a lovely, <laughs> lovely prospect for me to, to be able to sing something that was written for my voice that is also written somewhere that I can step into and relate to on a personal level. I really hope that happens. <laughs> I think it <laughs> Thank should. Thank you. Just to see how exciting that is for you. I was like, I think that we should try and make that happen. <laughs> what a fantastic answer. Thank you so much. Um, you. And I just, it's really, it's interesting what you say about um, how we're going to have, there's more scope in new music to be able to um, to do these things. Like we were talking before about um, the, the need to just kind of take, for instance, slave characters out of, uh, like off the stage and just mm -hmm. out of the the eye and it, it you know it makes me think that you know we're art and and entertainment has such an enormous role in in setting the tone for the world and like to just see things done in a way like i was watching <laughs> i was watching the um documentary about the last series of Shit's creek the other day because i watched that i've just finished right. watching that series and i watched that documentary and they were talking on that about how they'd they'd made this program where um, it, there wasn't really a lot of statement made about people's um, sexuality. It was just yeah. you know, it was just sort of there and it was celebrated and, and, and all that kind of thing. And it was just really it nice. was normalized. Was like, it was normalized, but also it was like a really funny, happy program that is feel good. It's not serious. It's not like yeah. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to watch something really serious. It's going to change my life. It was just like, I'm going to be entertained. And within that entertainment, I'm going to see something warm. And I love Shits Creek, as you can probably tell. It's something like <laughs> warm and, um, and, just, and just great. And just like portrayed how it should be without any of that other, uh, you know, of the crap that, that there is so much of. Um, yes. Um, that was just a thought on that. And anyway, so just a final question then. Can you just tell us about your final recital? It'll be out already when this episode goes out, but you were telling me about this programme yes. before and it's so exciting. Um, so just to say that Patricia's final recital um, at Leeds University, University of Leeds is coming up as we record, so we'll be out when we uh, finish, uh, when this is released. And yeah. I think it'll be streamable, is that right? Yeah, it's going to be live streamed on, on well, on Monday the 24th of May, um, but you can probably find it um, on the Leeds live stream website, and they have all the past live streams up, up on there as well. Um, and I'm singing a really fun programme of, I've got some Stravinsky up there, well, I've mentioned my two yeah, dream yeah, well, roles. Yeah. <laughs> So I've got the, the Rates Progress and Janice Geeky in there. I've got some Florence Price, some um, Amy Beach, some Ethel Smythe, some Undine Smith-Moore, who's a great composer who I just discovered like the other week. Uh, and I think Donizetti is the other one I didn't mention. <laughs> yeah. I just love that. I just think this programme sounds phenomenal and I'm definitely going to listen. I'm guessing that people were able to find it by um, looking at your social media as well, which we are uh, up at. Yeah, I'll be posting extensively video. about my recital. Oh, <laughs> quite right too. Um, and I just, um, I just got so excited thinking about that programme. I mean, if there was any indication of what music programming could be like when people are thinking about inclusivity all the time and discovering new music, uh, you know, um, all the time, not necessarily new as in written recently, but new as in, yeah. you know, new to me. It's the, all of it's new to me. Yeah, not within the sort of traditional canon. So yes, yes. I will definitely be watching. Very, very excited about that. Right, um, I think we shall round off. Thank you so much for coming and talking to me. 
um, for such an important conversation, Patricia. It's been such a pleasure. Um, Classical music, and especially opera, is one of the last great bastions of gender stereotypes, and you've made such a compelling case for much greater flexibility and willingness to embrace what trans performers bring to their art. If you want to read Patricia's article, Normalising Trans Bodies in Opera, you can find this in the Musicians' Union blog on their website, musiciansunion.org.uk, and we'll be putting the link in the show notes. You can also follow Patricia on social media with the Twitter and Facebook handle Ms Yates Tenor. Music Works is committed to exploring the challenges that face those communities who often struggle for full representation in the music industry and it's been such a privilege to be able to share this discussion with you. Patricia, good luck with your final recital and we wish you all the very best for the future. We'll be following thank your career you. with great interest. <laughs> oh, thank you ever so much. It's been really lovely to, to talk to you today. It's thank been you. such a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Works podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, check out our other great episodes, and even better, leave us a review. You can also sign up to our mailing list at www.polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash list for updates and news about what Polyphony Arts is up to for all you classical music folk out there. You can find more information in the show notes as well. Meanwhile, I'm Katie Beardsworth and I look forward to sharing with you the next great episode of Music Works. Music Works is generously supported by Alliance Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Alliance Music Insurance, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Music Works is a Polyphony Arts production. Thank you for listening. Thank you.